going to let anybody into my personal space. So as I go through this, it's just as simple as a block with no emotion attached to it at all. Um, if I'm talking to you, for instance, and Frankie or Four comes over, I won't even, it won't even, I won't hesitate. Or I could go, uh -huh. there. That's exactly where the dog should learn to stop, right outside your personal space zone. If we've done a really good job of making those boundaries clear. Uh -huh. But again, we as humans don't think that way. We're just like, oh, love, 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 love. And so with dogs, they're like, this is so confusing because in our world, like in our country, you know, this is not something we would do. So when I came the last time and we talked about all of the rules and the structure and the boundary and the consistency and the rules on the furniture and off of the furniture and mental and physical stimulation and going on pack walks together and helping them form a bond. And, and we talked about the three biggest bonding times for dogs, which is the pack walk, um, eating and, you know, eating together and sleeping together. So tell me after I left, what were some of the things that you guys feel you implemented consistently? Well, I don't, I thought you said walk them separately because Frankie has no walking manners, period. And we're trying to keep consistent with four and it wasn't working to do the, walk them both at the you same time. You mean if you're gonna be teaching leash etiquette? Uh -huh. Yes, I agree with you. So if, if, the, if the part of the, the walk that you guys are working on teaching him proper leash etiquette and teaching him proper leash etiquette, or her, sorry, him. her, him, yeah. I did that right, yeah. then I agree with you. I think that he's gotta learn Right? Mm -hmm. They have to learn separately how to walk appropriately on the leash, but then the goal is so that they can walk together. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so, were they ever sleeping together? No. They sleep here. This is Four's bed and that's Frankie's bed. So, on each side of the staircase. Now, when I brought that one home, I brought it home for Frank, but Four claimed it, so I went and got another one for Frank. Yeah, but was, no, they do not sleep. Together. together, together. Because Frankie sleeps with my mom in her bed. Mm -hmm. Four either sleeps with Piper in her bed or he sleeps on his own bed at the foot of our bed. Four has slept with us before, not very often, but <clears throat> uh, the last time he did, Four got on the bed first and asserted his dominance and slept on my pillow, my other pillow, which is where Frank always sleeps, and then Frank slept at the foot of the bed. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, okay, if they're working it out, I'm not gonna change it. I don't know if that was right or wrong. Well, first of all, your bed is, think of your bed like the queen's throne. The dog should understand that it's an invitation-only place. And so no dog should ever be allowed up on your chair, your bed, your couch, your anything, unless invited. Mm -hmm. So were they invited or did they, were they just, hey, here's our bed? Because this is where you guys are gonna have issues. Mm -hmm. So if, uh -uh. So if I don't make it clear to them, not only our relationship, the relationship I have with each of my dogs, right? and I don't respect the hierarchy that I've put in place. And remember the three questions that I asked you guys last time? How to determine pecking order? Has that changed? I don't think anything's changed. Do you remember the three questions and how we determined who was gonna be top dog? No, I don't. Okay, so this is good because we'll have it on tape. So. Um, and and you remember the last time I said this, everybody might have a different answer based on each person's relationship that you have with that dog. Mm -hmm. So if I were to say, which of the dogs would you guys say has the most calming, zen-like, balanced energy? Frankie. Okay. Which of the dogs listens to you the most consistently when you give them a correction or a command? Okay. Which of the dogs acts the most con commonsensically 
in any given situation? Maybe. You gotta pick. Four. four. Okay, so four would be your, your? Dog. Mm -hmm. Dog. Yeah. Now, what, what would you say is not balanced about Frankie? Frankie's personality is do -de do You know, he's more the, the donkey in Winnie the Pooh. Okay. Yeah, and he doesn't feel like he needs to listen. Yeah. Like, we've been working with him nonstop to, like, if we're cooking, mm -hmm. no dogs allowed in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I have to constantly, and I, and I mean constantly, tell Frankie out of the kitchen. But are you talking to him? him? Are you literally saying those words? Yeah, and yes. Okay, so do you remember when, point when, and I but, him remember when I was saying anytime you're trying to keep get a dog to stop doing something, you don't look at him, you don't talk to him, you don't touch him. Well, I just do all of that right there. <laughs> so if I start engaging with my dog in some sort of dialogue, he goes oh, you're talking to me, or she goes, oh, you're talking to me, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of going, oh, you want me to come over here? We have to remember that co eye contact, first and foremost, is attention, okay? So if you look at him, and you're talking to him, at the same time, your body's going this way, he's like, which is it, right? If you just go like this, that's pretty clear, because I'm not going to look right at him, right? I'm going to go like this. And trust me, he will go away. So how come I can do that to four? Mm -hmm. Exactly the same thing I do to Frankie. I look at him and I point and I say, out of the kitchen. My dog will leave the kitchen. But he doesn't. So how come, <coughs> how come he understands that? Or what did I do? I don't, I don't know the difference. I mean, I'm going to guess Frankie lived with you separately from these guys for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. And from, if memory serves, you didn't have a lot of structure and boundaries with Frankie. He pretty much got to do whatever he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So now he comes into an environment where all the rules are changing, and, but he's had how many years of being able to do it his way? We are fostering a, a dog, a Cavalier King Charles, and... What? Yes. You're fostering it? Yes. Does it need a home? <laughs> Don't start. <laughs> That's um, my... So we're fostering this Cavalier King Charles, he's one year old. His first year lived in this 88-year-old woman's house, and she didn't have a backyard. She, the dog had the run of the house. The dog got zero walks, or very few walks. She, the lady had fallen, got a couple concussions, and the dog was just hypersensitive to every sound. So here, is, we just got this dog a couple weeks ago, and is it, with our pack, and this dog has no boundaries. Doesn't understand. Oh no, he would just, he just climb on you. Just like, climbs up. He, there's just none. So this is what I think is happening with Frankie, the difference between you have at least some rules that you've instilled from early on. Mm -hmm. Whereas he had, or yeah, he has not. So, and then my, my thing is trying to get everybody to treat their dogs the same way because what you do with Frankie downstairs, but then when he comes up here, the rules might be different. And it's gonna be really hard for him to understand why are the rules different downstairs than when I come upstairs, mm -hmm. right? So if there's times with, when they're supposed to be co-mingling, but how you interact with Frankie downstairs is sort of setting him up for failure once he comes upstairs by getting into people's personal space because you allow him into yours, you see how that can throw off what they're doing up here. So the first thing I wanna know or make sure is that everybody is doing exactly the same thing so that it doesn't matter what level these dogs are on or who's taking care of them, the rules are the rules of the rules. Um, I asked you a question last night on the phone. And you said, that's a good question. And I wanted to ask these guys because they weren't privy to that question. It was, 
when, because I was trying to help you understand why it's not the dog and why it's us. And I said, do, do, don't you guys find it interesting that their issues have never occurred in the absence of a human being? So if this truly was a for Frankie issue, why are they able to coexist peacefully when you guys are not here? And because you're you're the bone, you're the resource. It's like the dog protects his bone. Uh -huh. You guys are the the chew toy. You're the uh, the tennis ball. And that's kind of how I want you all to see that, because that is the the way in which I think most people can see it a little clear clearer. That when people are really worrying that it's a dog on dog issue, then you have to look at it that way and go, really because they coexist just fine when they're by themselves. So if a dog, the relationship a dog has with their own toy or their own bone, now think about this. They go over, they get it anytime they want it, right? And then they hoard it and they chew on it and they hide it, right? So every time your dog wants your attention, you give it, just like when he wants to go get his bone, he gets it. Right? That's is why I don't leave toys out all day long for them to just decide which ones are theirs. I maintain control over all resources. I give them access to them. I also pick them up and put them away so that they're, they always remain mine. Right? No one gets to have ownership of anything, including beds and furniture, because the biggest resources to a dog, you, uh, dog beds, crates can become high-end resources, uh, food bowls, we wash them, we put them up. Now, the water bowl stays down all the time. No big deal. But, the, but you can be just as much of a huge resource to your dog as a bone would be, right? So if all of a sudden they make claim on you, and just like with what happened to you, Frankie came over and was like, and he was like, oh, hell no. Uh -huh. Boom. Whereas when you're not here, there's nothing. They just... Coexist, some dogs get up on the couch, some don't. It's like whatever, 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 and they're fine. So how come you guys aren't coming home to a bloodbath? We're afraid we are. <laughs> yeah, we are afraid now. But did Casey tell you that Four growled or started mm -hmm. to attack Frank again last night? Well, yeah, that was the door. The do any doorway that leads into or out of the house is a huge resource. And that's why at our house, the door opening means nothing. I can open up any door from the garage door to the front door to the back door. And I did this purposely because to a dog, a door is a door, it doesn't matter, right? But I wanted to make sure that they understood that that door could open up and they look at it and they go, or they look at the door opening and then they look at me and they wait. And as soon as they make eye contact with me, I will say each dog's name and I will say, Buddy. And Buddy is the only one that goes out that door. And they're all like, Am I next? Am I next? And whoever I call, and in whatever order I want, that they know that that's the rules. Because otherwise you get that kind of effect where they all try to bolt out the door at the same time and that's a fight starter. That's why in certain doggy daycares, most of the fights will occur with the dogs coming in that gate and the dogs pulling out of that gate. 